Thornton, and I'm the Associate Director of Admissions at Marlboro. I'd like to welcome you to our faculty panel this evening. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention a couple of things. I want to thank those who submitted questions. We received a lot of them. And because of that, we made the decision to turn off our chat and Q&A functions. So if you have any remaining questions once this evening is over, please do not hesitate to email us at admissions at marlboro.org and we will get back to you. In addition, we did receive um, a couple of questions regarding admissions process. Tonight is dedicated to faculty related questions. So again, um, anything that you want answered regarding that, please email us and we will walk you through it and get back to you. I'm now gonna hand this over to Laura Hotchkiss. She is our Associate Head of School for Academics and the Upper School Director. In addition, she is an alumna of Marlboro. So Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. Well, you've done a great job of introducing me, so I don't need to take up too much time, but I'm so excited to be here with all of you this evening and you are gonna get some great information from our panelists. So I'm gonna go ahead and let the panelists introduce themselves and then we will start with our questions. Mpombo, you wanna start? Sure, good evening. Uh, my name is Mpombo Wina. I teach dance. I am also chair of the Performing Arts Department and teach uh, mainly upper school. Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Bannister. I'm the math department head. I teach all levels of math from pre-algebra to multivariable calculus. And I also um, am the advisor to the math club, which is very student run though. Thank you, Kenichi. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'll go again. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kenichi Charles. I'm a science instructor and also the eighth grade dean. I work primarily in the middle school, but I also teach some upper school courses. Uh, this is my eighth year at Marlboro, and uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you. Kathy. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Atwell, and I am Dean of Student Research at Marlboro, and I oversee our Honors Research Program in Humanities and Social Sciences. I also teach in the History Department. I, this is my 17th year at Marlboro. I've worn a lot of hats over those years, department head, grade level dean, and I've taught every grade except 10th. Uh, also, I am the faculty advisor for Marlboro's Girls Go Global Club. Great, thank you. And finally, Brett. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Brett Quimby. Uh, I teach in the English department. Uh, I've been at Marlboro for 11 years and like Kathy, I've taught every grade except for 11th. So between us, we have all of the math, our English and history grades covered. I also work as the Dean of Student Life uh, and I sit on the advisory leadership uh, team. So welcome. Thank you. So we are sure to have uh, an energized conversation this evening and give you a little peek into what the classrooms feel like at Marlboro. So I thought I would kick it off by asking each of our panelists to respond to this question. What is your favorite thing about teaching at Marlboro? I'm just gonna let you jump in and we'll try to do the Zoom pause time so we don't all talk at the same time. I'll go. I, I, I think for me, it's really, really simple. Um, year in, this is my 16th year um, now, and year in and year out, just teaching um, young students who love the process of learning. They really love the process of learning. And um, being in an all girls school, it's, it's amplified. It's amplified because they're not afraid um, to, to, to show their, their hunger and uh, yearning for knowledge. Um, so that is a, a gift for me day in and day out. I could probably go next because I'd like to piggyback off of that. What I most about uh, teaching at Marlboro is just that reciprocity. It's not just about what we are imparting on um, to the girls. Every year I'm so excited by what I get to learn from the new crop of students that come in they are just so well-rounded and well-versed in things of the world that I learn um, so much from them. So that's what I enjoy most. And I guess to yeah, add something, 
uh, additional, of course, my first response is, I think as every teacher at Marlboro is like the students, of course. Uh, but I also wanted to, to just give a shout out to my colleagues because this is a place where I am continually surprised by the, um, the expertise and the collegiality and the creativity of my colleagues. And I, I have learned to be a better teacher um, pretty much every year in some way since I've started. It always keeps the experience of being a teacher and a professional here fresh. I think I can probably say it's the fact that I don't think I've ever given what I would call a lecture like my whole time teaching here because our students are so interactive and they really participate with you, whatever you do. I would just add, you know, for me, I always keep coming back to the students when I think about why I love teaching at Marlboro. And I think my take on it is getting to see who they become um, by the time they, they leave the school. Um, having taught a bunch of the seventh graders who are now seniors. I taught them in English in seventh grade and it's so wonderful to think about the conversations they, they had then when some of them, their feet couldn't even necessarily touch the floor from some of the chairs. And now they are these incredible people who I know are gonna go off and you know, change the world. As trite as that sounds, but it's true. I, you know, these, these kids are so thoughtful and energized and want to be engaged. And that's wonderful to see. Thank you all for that. And actually the next question probably um, tag teams a little bit on your answers, but let's go right into being in a girl's school. So how do you think being in a girl's school impacts your teaching? Anybody? I could jump in. Brett? I, I, I've worked in co-ed schools as well. And I think one of the things that I noticed on day one at Marlboro was everybody speaks. Uh, and everybody has a voice. And that I think really, it, it was dramatic. There were, there were girls that I saw that I thought maybe in a co-ed environment might not speak as much, um, but in an, especially in an English classroom, it's so wonderful to, to know that there's just, everybody is comfortable, everybody's like, the expectation is that they are all going to be speaking. And I think that that uh, is a wonderful thing in terms of my teaching. And I think there are so many powerful things that the students learn in seeing their fellow peers lead. And I think that that's a really impactful thing for them moving forward where they go off to college and say, of course, well, I will be president of whatever club I'm going to join. Of course, I'm going to start the conversation. Of course, I'm going to run for school president. Why not? Anybody else? Yeah. I'd also like to share just, you know, how that, how that sort of like sisterhood has an impact on their learning in the classroom, because it's, I mean, Brett spoke about them using their voices and really pushing for, uh, pushing for what they want, pushing for what they need, advocating for themselves. And I think uh, what also happens in the classroom is that they're they're just free to think and free to learn because they don't have all of these extra things to worry about or to be concerned about. And they their their minds are just open and free to really truly fully engage without sort of that the, that stress of thinking about the other things that might concern them in a co-ed environment. Yeah, Kathy, go for it. I also think um, going along with what Kenichi was saying, there is, with that sisterhood, um, a sense of, of collaborative mission, um, you know, that they're all kind of in it together, um, that, that continues even after they, they graduate. And we hear a lot of the alums reflect that back to us when they come to visit. Um, and I think it also is a place where, going off of what Brett was saying, there's like, there's a place for leadership and everyone is kind of expected to kind of find the way that you can be of service, you can, you can to the, the wider world. And I don't know that that is always quite as explicitly um, articulated, uh, except in girls' schools, in my experience working in both co-ed and, and um, single-sex environments. 
I love those answers. And you, you definitely give, give a great vision for me of what it feels like to be, to be in our classrooms. So let me pivot to the question that's probably on everyone's mind. Um, and I'm gonna merge a couple questions here together, but um, can, can you talk a little bit about homework? What's the right amount of homework? And how do you, how do we as a school balance student wellness with academic rigor? I could jump in. I definitely think I'm always asking them. I mean, a lot of us are trying to do Zoom polls right now in general about how long things take. But I've always just said in every class I teach, like, if it gets past a certain amount of time, and that number might change depending on the level of the class in the year, just tell me and I'm just going to tell you stop working. Like, it all comes down to the communication, really. It's like, I, I, you know, it's, our students are very proactive. They'll tell us what's going on, but we also ask them and listen to them. So, and I'm also this year, I'm whittling things down and I'm thinking like, maybe I can do this next year. Maybe I can do less of this next year and it'll still be the same purpose achieved. Great. Anyone else? Homework, balance. Yes, I can, I can add to that. And I know a few of us here are actually on the committee that took a look at uh, a focused look at homework uh, a while back and, you know, collected data from the students, collected data from teachers and asked, you know, what is your experience like? Because oftentimes we have our perception is not the reality. And we got some good information from that. And I think there has been a shift in thinking for teachers all over and especially at Marlboro to look at, you know, what is the purpose of our homework? What purpose is it serving? And can we achieve the same goal in different ways? And so we've built into our, our lessons more time to have those, those sort of brief check-ins or, you know, does the practice need to happen outside of class? Can we build in practice into our lesson? And can we have those checkpoints where the students can check in with themselves and see if they understand and they can ask questions in the moment. So I think we've developed um, some new strategies to get to the same goal other than, um, rather than just assigning homework. And that I think has reduced the level quite a bit. I think there's a real focus on the why and the purpose, Kenichi. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm going to pivot a little bit to, uh, to the extracurricular program. Uh, question here, can a student join both Marlboro's volleyball team and also be an instrumental ensemble or, may, or will she be forced to choose due to scheduling conflicts? We make it um, our mission in the performing arts um, that students can do many, many, many things, not many things, a few things um, at least. So it's the way we, we organize our extracurriculars or if we have an athlete, for example, and they want to be an instrumental ensemble, there's a way to always work that out. So the way our programming works and our calendar, they're, they're, barely, they're very rarely clashes. Um, but we take each student individually because we realize that that is an education, this is an educational institution. So, and they want to try different things. So we try to make that as possible, as much as possible. I think that also comes up, Kathy, a little bit between honors research and extracurricular activities. So maybe you can speak a little bit to how you help the students manage those conflicts. Absolutely. Uh, so we want students to be able to take advantage of the full range of opportunities that Marlboro has while also um, helping them to understand that there should be some sort of healthy balance in their lives. And as they go up through the, the years and get into the um, junior and senior years, there, there, is, there are kind of countervailing pressures, one of which is like, oh my God, I got to cram as much stuff as possible onto my resume so that I can apply to college. And um, also, you know, this need to be able to do what you are doing well, and most importantly, from my perspective, enjoy it. And so what we counsel students to do is to think about what brings them joy and what they think is going to really help them tell a compelling story about themselves. Um, and, you know, we, we're not all about the college process, but we have to be realistic that this is a college preparatory school. And um, there's nothing worse than doing stuff that you feel like you have to do because you feel like you have to check that box. 
But if there's something like with honors research that is um, intrinsically interesting to you, motivating to you because it's your own pro project and you have ownership of it, then you are just gonna want to do that. And the work doesn't feel like drudgery. Um, we also you know, help students to figure out like if you have a sport that is in the fall, what is that going to mean for your, for your ability to go to a lab? Well, let's figure out how we can you know, give you time here and then be able to manage what you're doing in class or maybe work, do your homework during school uh, or during your free period so that you really do have time to, to do the things that are most important, but prune away the things that are really just, um, just the chaff. I don't know if I- I hope, yeah, I hope what you're hearing is really that communication from, from Ms. Wiener's comments to Dr. Atwell's. It's that communication with their teachers to help them find a passion, a pathway, something they're enthusiastic about, but at the same time, create that sense of, sense of balance. Let's pivot to transitions. So um, maybe you can share the ways we have helped seventh graders transition into the school as well as ninth graders. I think we probably have some parents on the call whose daughters are applying to ninth grade. So what are ways in which we help the new ninth graders transition to Marlboro as well as our new seventh graders? I can jump in with the, the ninth grade. Um, I used to also be ninth grade dean, um, and I know that in Jean, her role as eighth grade dean sort of starts things off um, with the, the eighth graders. Um, and uh, this year they had a Netflix party, um, and with with the current eighth or last year's eighth graders and then the newly enrolled ninth graders, um, and the school sent everybody uh, some some theater snacks and some fuzzy socks and they had a Netflix viewing party together. Um, and then they wrote a lot of uh, postcards to the new students. So this each new student got, uh, I think around three to five uh, postcards. Mm -hmm. And then during the year itself, um, well, over the summer there were Zooming into friendship um, Zooms, uh, which was pretty much every, every month, I believe, uh, or each Sunday in August, actually. Sorry, the, uh, they had class council had a zoom just hang out with them to get to know them uh, and then in the fall there's been a series of lunches there's been a social contact sheet uh, the first class meeting the the new ninth graders were introduced by the class council uh, so everybody got to know them and something interesting about them and there's been uh, breakfasts um, with the their dean along throughout the year and then there's also been a lot of sort of get to know you sort of speed dating or um, like kind of those type of events during class meetings so that they're getting to see a lot of new kids, even if they're not in those, their classes. That's great, thank you. What about with seventh grade? Someone speak to Violet's 101? Sure, uh, so with seventh grade, we, we really have a great set of deans at Marlboro and our seventh grade dean is really wonderful. She's been sort of reimagining and reevaluating some of the experiences that we've offered to the seventh graders. And this year, she created a sort of like a mentorship program where she had some of the rising, uh, rising eighth graders who just finished their seventh grade year meet up with uh, new seventh graders in small group over the summer. And then with Violet's 101, it was a really great opportunity to help students get prepared for the year, to help them feel comfortable and confident with the, the tools that they would need to start school on day one, knowing, you know, they're understanding their schedule, knowing how to get organized, uh, uh, understanding all of Marlboro's policies and guidelines, all the sort of need to know things that uh, would uh, help you just feel like you're set for that day one. And also an opportunity to, uh, to communicate and socialize with the other seventh graders in the class and also some of their new teachers, which was great. Uh, I think we had, uh, I don't know the percentage, but a, a, a wide range of teachers and a lot of seventh grade uh, teachers participated in Violet's 101 programming. So it was a really great opportunity for them to get to know and see and meet their teachers before having that initial classroom experience. That's great. Anybody else on that one? Okay, from your, from your vantage point um, as a faculty member, what characteristics do you think, or do you look for in a student who's going to be successful at Marlboro? So what do, what do you think makes a successful Marlboro student? Um, I think this, this 
these these qualities go back to um, the things that we focus on um, in I, I find it all over all over the school, but also in the performing arts and um, it's a capacity for emotional intelligence. Um, it is um, building confidence. Um, it is collaborative skill building and mostly the dedication to process because once you learn one aspect of a dedication to process, you can apply it to anything in your life. Um, so those are those are those are some of the qualities I believe are are, are really really vital. That's great, Melissa. What do you think? I mean, one thing I think is proactive and communicating, and I think those things really go together because um, a really successful student here would be able to work with a group and figure out their homework. Okay, let's go meet with the teacher guys. Let's figure this out, and they'll tell the teacher if they're having a really rough night and need an extension on something. Just really that communication in all directions is so crucial here. Okay. Kathy, you wanna share? Sure, and I just wanna add on to that, which is, you know, we have students who are extremely outgoing. We have students who are much shyer and more reserved, particularly when they show up here. And um, one of the things I really appreciate about Marlboro is the, the, the kind of to all the touch points that there are, you know, there are always somebody kind of looking out for you and reaching out for you. And so if we think about the kind of student that is, who is going to do really well, it's a student who is receptive to that kind of, um, to that kind of care, um, you know, and also I think someone who is, um, who is able then to transfer that kindness that they receive to others. I think we have a very kind, um, really a really kind community in general, and we really emphasize that. Um, and I would also say that students who have a kind of a curiosity and um, a willingness just with that curiosity and that kind of intensity and desire to learn, a willingness to kind of laugh and be silly. Um, because this is a place where we want students to find joy. And um, if, if they find it hard to do that, it can be hard to connect. So there's some specific questions here about curriculum and this will speak to you, know, uh, you on the call here um, in particular. So, so what's the philosophy of the math department? Tell us a little bit about how our math teachers go about teaching math. Well, we all believe very strongly in a growth mindset approach. There's no such thing as tracking here. When you come in, we really look at your, your placement test, your work, your teacher recommendation. And really every year, we're looking at what your current teacher says, you know, and trying to help you grow as a math student. Maybe this is a year where maybe you have never tried honors, but now you kind of feel like you can, you want to fit it into your schedule and your teacher thinks it's a good idea. You know, there's always that chance for growth as a student in regular and in honors. And, you know, we have students that uh, love math so much, they take two math classes their senior year. We got AP statistics as a second op option. And really it's just always meeting, meetings, meetings, meetings. Even on Zoom, my students are meeting with me, which is great. And just that you can grow, you can improve, you can learn and just always encouraging that. That's great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and what about the balance of teaching the, the sort of classical works of Western literature and more recent works in our, in our English curriculum or in other areas where literature shows up? I can talk a little bit about that. Um, and I think I'll, I'll use an example of a curriculum to, to illustrate how we think about it, because I think uh, we think about skills and what skills we want the students to learn over their six years or four years at Marlboro. Uh, and then we also think about the texts and the voices of, in those texts so that students see people like them, regardless of uh, their background or identities. Um, and we are, we talk a lot about how to have a representative uh, curriculum um, and that sometimes includes older texts and sometimes it includes newer texts. Um, in terms of an example, so the 10th grade is a year that we normally look at American literature. And we started uh, with The Great Gatsby, which many of you may have read as well. It's been around for a while. Um, but we looked at it through the lens of, you know, sort of pose this question, what is America? What does it mean to, to be in America? What is, what is our relationship to that term? and then look at how various texts over time have addressed that question. And we, we, in reading The Great Gatsby, we also complicated it and said, 
whose voices are here, whose voices are not here. Um, you know, what, what kind of community is being uh, presented to us and, you know, where are there places where we do not see voices? And then we, we ended that unit and now we're reading a, a lot of authors from the Harlem Renaissance. So same place, same era, uh, but very different um, uh, messages about what America is and, and what the future can hold. Uh, and so we, we sort of are always continually asking ourselves uh, when, we, when we need to have uh, conversations about what to place in the curriculum. In the second semester, we're having a contemporary novel called Believers, um, which, you know, to, to, which will tie back to this idea of what is America um, that deals with undocumented immigration. And so we will talk about that in the second semester. Thank you, that's great. Uh, Ms. Wiener, how about the performing arts program, not just inside the classroom, but what are some of the extracurricular, the outside of the classroom opportunities for students? Well, we have, um eight fully staged productions a year. <laughs> and yeah, so um, that is, you know, we have uh, performances in choral, of course, in dance, instrumental ensembles, makerspace and theater. And students have an opportunity to get involved in any aspect whatsoever, whether it's on the uh, tech team, whether they're learning about lights or whether they're learning how to build sets or sew costumes. Um, there are many, many opportunities and uh, our doors are, are wide open. Um, we have faculty who um, are, are very, very, um, very, very good in just taking each student, realizing what they wanna do, who they are and tailoring experiences um, for them so that they can, they can grow within that that we have a full program and uh, whatever aspect students come in wanting to learn, um, we always have something for them. That's great. So when you think about um, our curriculum, um, do we differentiate for students that are at different levels, either through curriculum selection or actually in, in a class, might you um, ask some students to do more work if they appear more advanced? How do we sort of differentiate all of these students that come into our classroom? How do we differentiate the instruction? Michi, you wanna you wanna take that one? Sure. I thinking about that for a minute. I think that this is a concern that comes up often for parents, especially in the middle school when they have, I'm thinking of seventh graders coming from all of these different experiences in different schools where particularly in science, they may have had uh, they may have had an experience where science was maybe once a week and didn't involve any labs or they might've had science uh, much more often and with regular experimentation and laboratory exercises. So with that variety in experiences and our understanding that that is uh, what we're, that's what the girls are entering into, there's no expectation for prior knowledge when they come in, but we also know that we don't want to, you know, we don't want to bore the students who have maybe seen material before. And then we don't, don't want to surpass those who, who are entering into a topic or a subject for the first time. So I can give you an example of one of the things I do and what our teaching team does in the middle school is that we often will take, uh, take lessons that are designed for maybe a higher level of uh, a higher um, grade level and we will modify it for middle school, but then those elements that we've removed that were maybe too, um, too high level for the majority of the students, we'll still make it available. We're we will curate it and make it available on our learning management system, for example, and all students will have access to it and students who are interested in exploring more can go to these additional exercises or these videos, whatever that content is, and they, they can still engage in that so they won't be sort of uh, feet, left feeling like they need or, or want more. So that's one example of something we can do to, to uh, vary the, the experience. Thank you. And so Melissa, maybe you'll speak a little bit to how we do placement for incoming seventh graders or incoming ninth graders, because that's another way in which we, we differentiate it differently than the, than the way Kenichi was speaking about in science. For sure, because in math, I mean, especially this year of all years, everyone had a different experience coming in. A lot of it is, you know, I mean, we look at their teacher recommendation, we look at their placement test, and I'll even, you know, I'll if I'm if something's really unclear, I'll try to reach out to the current teacher for extra information. But 
a lot of it we can, you know, the placement test, it's interesting because I think a lot of students before they come to Marlboro, like it's about getting the right answer. And now, especially in pre-algebra and algebra one, so much of it is about showing the work. Can I justify my steps algebraically and making sure they're ready to do that at whatever level course they're coming into. So um, there's a lot. So the placement test really helps, but it's also really just trying to establish where they're at in terms of showing that work and then learning how to do that once they're here. And, you know, we always communicate if, if parents want to reach out, I can always talk to them about when, when we're, if we're when, along the process. Thanks, Melissa. We, we do similarly in the world languages. We don't have a world language teacher on the, on the, on the webinar, but similarly around placement for, for world languages. Um, great. Does anybody else want to add about differentiation or ways in which we might address the very needs of students academically, or shall we move? Shall I move on? Kathy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the ways that's really important is the individual individualized feedback that we give to uh, students on their work. And you know, every student comes in at a different uh, degree of proficiency as a writer. Everyone is, um, you know, in seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. So having the opportunity to really interact um, very closely with uh, your teacher and to kind of work at a pace that makes sense for you to achieve what you are capable of achieving um, is, I think, really, really important. Um, and so, and many departments are actually starting to look more at master at some version of mastery based grading. Um, and this is um, a way that we can help students to think more about, okay, what can I personally achieve as opposed to um, judging myself against a peer who may be at a different level in her in her development of, of any particular skill or understanding. Um, and then for students who are extremely advanced, um, it, it goes the other way, right? Like we find opportunities to recommend additional books to read, or maybe they might want to do a special studies. I have a student right now, in fact, who is taking Russian with me because she decided she wanted to learn Russian and she was kind of bored. And so this was a great way for her to um, to do that and exercise that other part of her brain and develop a relationship with the teacher. Because I wasn't even her, her teacher at that time, but I was her club advisor and now I'm her teacher. And so knowing her in that way means that I can also recommend additional resources for her that will allow her to connect what she is um, interested in with the curriculum that we're covering. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you touched on a question that's in a, a couple of these here, but it's how do students develop those relationships with teachers in the classroom and outside of the classrooms? Maybe you could share the ways in which you work to develop those relationships. We've heard so much tonight about feedback, uh, knowing students, meeting students where they are. What are some examples of that as you see it in your classrooms? I mean, you're going to go, Melissa. Great. I was like, oh, go ahead. Am I supposed to go? <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead, Melissa. Okay. I mean, I definitely think that meetings are one of the ways I get to know students the most. You know, even if they they did well on a test, they have a couple questions. If I get to meet with me, that's great. You know, I get to know them better. I've I've talked to students about like the math they did in elementary school that led to this moment, and I just feel like that's really when I get um just all my kind of deeper connections, and I, I'm so glad when students want to meet. What about the club program and how that inspires students sort of outside of the classroom to make those connections? Brett, maybe you can talk a little bit to that vast array of opportunities. I could speak generally and I think, or Kathy, do you wanna go first? I saw you had your, okay. Um, I, I, yes, I, we just had our club fair. Normally we do a, a club fair in, at the beginning of October and we did it virtually this year where students had to put together a mission statement, a description of their club and a YouTube link uh, that was the leaders on a Zoom call talking about their club. And I think we have 64 or 66 clubs and affinity groups uh, on campus. And it's really incredible the work that they do. Um, so there are, uh, so in terms of the clubs, they can range from, there's like a cheese club where they talk about different cheeses um, but then there are so many um, clubs where the students are active in their community, where they are, um, you know, trying to do outreach and partner with the rest of Los Angeles uh, and trying to 
build relationships outside of the school. Uh, there's a tutoring program that, that the, with a, a local elementary school that I believe, Melissa, you worked with at Third Street Tutoring. Have you done that? Uh, I haven't been going for a while, but we, we were doing that for a long time, yeah. And so there's, there's a really broad array, and that is a place where students get to know each other based on their interests uh, or identities in, in affinity groups, uh, and also can build bonds with their advisors as well. And you know, we, we Brett, is there a community service requirement in terms of a number of hours? No, there is not. There is not. We have a, a social justice and community partnerships department, uh, and they are they have sort of grown in stature in the time that I've been at Marlboro, and I think a lot of students are involved in community partnerships in one way or another, but it is not required. I think they just want to do it because they see their, their peers doing it. Great. Yeah, thank you. So I, I'm a little conscious of time. And while I don't want to bemoan uh, or, or spend too much time on remote learning, because we are all incredibly hopeful that when your daughters join Marlboro, we will be back in person. But I also don't want to ignore the elephant in the room. So there are a few questions here around um, remote learning. And I think actually many of the answers to these questions will mirror and parallel so much of what you've been talking about, that focus on the relationship. Um, but maybe you can just speak to how do you think your students have have handled remote learning? I'll speak to that. Um, I think that the students have handled it really, really well. And going back to what some of us have said about how we connect with students, um, I think there's been a great effort to, to have a deeper connection and, and checking in much more on individual um, students. And I've seen a great difference in my students because they have to feel seen. Um, and really checking in on them individually because they all have different relationships to, you know, to the uh, to the to their laptops, to the screens. Um, but I think they've been quite valiant and have handled it very, very well. And I can speak to um, the surveys that the survey results that we've uh, we've received from you know the responses we've received for students because I've helped put together a couple of those and. It's really um, been incredible to see the, um, the degree to which students have been thankful of, about the experiences that they've had, particularly when they compare their experiences at Marlboro, both this spring and then this fall, because we just did another survey, uh, compared to their, some of their peers at other schools. They really feel like um, Marlboro teachers have kind of stepped up. Uh, and they are also, even while maintaining a very high degree of academic expectation um, and, and um, the work that's being done in the classes, there's an enormous amount of support. And you know, to, to see the students articulate that so directly um, is, is really gratifying. I think it also, it's not to say that there aren't challenges and that they don't get sick of being on the screen all day long. They'll tell you that they get sick of, uh, of being on the screen, but the fact that they're also able to reflect to us what's working for them and what's not working for them, I think is really, is really a positive. And so, you know, we're always experimenting with what the best schedule is for students, what's going to, um, what's going to meet their um, social emotional needs, as well as their academic needs, and also, you know, the, that of those of the teachers as well. Absolutely. They're grateful for their teachers, but they are, they are also grateful for the way in which we are, are continuing to engage relationally with them. Um, so to that point, and Melissa, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but someone else might want to answer this. Do you think your, experiencing, your experience with teaching virtually has informed you in ways you might teach when we are quote unquote back to normal or back in person? Are there things that you're doing this year and doing in this environment that you're thinking this works really well, I'm gonna do this again? Yeah, Melissa, go ahead. We're right now, homework is never counted as late. And I don't know why I'd ever count homework late again. Like it just kind of isn't like, I'm just, I mean, it, a lot of teachers who are on some of these committees have talked about, you know, it being a behavioral thing, a homework, but I'm just, they turn, I mean, they know they need to do it to understand the test. Our students really understand what homework is for. And it just makes so much more sense. I mean, they do it. And if it's like a day late, it's not like, who cares? Like they're still getting the feedback. It, it all makes sense. Great. Anyone I'm, else? Yeah. I'm finding that um, students are really enjoying breakout rooms um, where they can actually, I, I'm finding that collaboration is becoming much more important 
uh, for students where, you know, you may have the, the teaching time, but then once they're able to just go off and be with each other to either solve problems or create something, they're really, really enjoying that. And that's something that I'm thinking about with certain classes moving forward uh, once, we're, once we're in person. It's great. Anybody I else? Yeah, Kenichi. A little bit onto that. Yeah, just th thinking about how, you know, my current practices will inform what I do when I go back. I, I know that we are all, we are all aware of the importance of, you know, teaching and learning, but I think this distance education in this virtual environment has really brought to the forefront the importance of uh, well-being and social emotional wellness connection all of those things and if we were getting you know too deep into the content I think now we've sort of like taken a step back and realized like these are all of the things that make up the the whole experience and they are uh, equally as important and that we should focus on those moments in the classroom as well and so um, the, we are really intensely trying to inject that into our practice as as we're over zoom and i think when we return you know we're not just going to drop it and you know put it on a shelf somewhere i think we'll continue to incorporate those practices into our uh, our teaching and learning in our classrooms i think that speaks as well kanichi to one of the questions here about continuing training continuing ed i know some of most of us participated in a in an online seminar this summer to learn how to do this better but do you want, does anyone want to speak to sort of how you keep up with your craft, the kind of professional development and the kind of support you have from the school to do that? Um, sure, I can go. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Melissa. Yeah. Oh, you go ahead. You go ahead first. Okay. So there, there, this moment right now is is producing uh, an incredible amount, uh, incredible number of opportunities for us to engage in to improve ourselves. And you heard Kathy say at the beginning of this that every year she feels like she's becoming a better teacher and she's she's learning something from uh, from our colleagues. So we do we do everything. We learn from each other. We have sort of like mentoring lunches in the middle school. We have share outs in, in division meetings. Uh, we have our own, we lead professional development for each other. We attend workshops, seminars, webinars. We do everything, and the school is. Uh, very supportive. Anything I've ever wanted to do in terms of professional development has been supported by the school. And I've always, in addition to that, always been given an opportunity to sort of come back and, and share that with my colleagues. So that's really a focus of our community. And I think one of the reasons why we're able to maintain such a, a high level of excellence with our educational program is because we're constantly reevaluating, revamping, reimagining what we do and, and not sort of just continuing because it, it's, it's already good. Um, we're, we're always thinking about how to make it better. Yeah, Kathy. And I'm also appreciative in addition to the individual um, opportunities and the, the flexibility that we have uh, for that. I mean, I finished my doctorate um, and Marlboro supported that, which was really incredible. Um, but also that we have these community-wide opportunities to learn. And I think the chance to do that across departments, across disciplines has been really, really enriching. And you know, those, those thematic um, opportunities, whether they be about equity and inclusion or um, mastery-based learning, whatever it is, like really connects the community and promotes interdisciplinarity in a way that um, I find really, really helpful as an educator. So Christine has popped in, but I had one more question I wanted to ask because I am someone who just loves the stories, the stories of our students. So I'm wondering if any of you have a story that you might tell about a student who maybe overcame um, a challenge or was able to accomplish something that you could tell she was really not sure she was gonna gonna be able to make it and how you how you supported her and helped her in that. I have one to share. Okay. I love this question <laughs> because I have one sticks out uh, for me. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had an eighth grade student who who came to me and said, I'm just I'm just not a science kid, which is 
you know, hurts my soul. And I wanted to convince her that, you know, that just is not true. You don't have to love science to be successful at science. You have to love being curious, love being creative, love being skeptical, love being observant, all of those things. And so we, we made a plan together. We set small goals and she went from like the C range to an A because she, she decided I'm going to believe in myself. I'm going to let go of this idea that I'm not a science kid. And it was so exciting to see, you know, over the course of a, of a school year, her just have these small wins and sort of just morph into this Maybe she calls herself a science kid now. I don't know. I have to check in with her, but um, that was a fantastic experience for me. Love that. Thank you. Anybody else? I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I just wanted to, to put in a plug for honors research in this respect, because one of the things that both my partner, Dr. Ponzio, who handles the lab science side, and I have noticed is that it's often the students who aren't at the very, very tippy top of the academic um, pile, you know, in terms of how many APs they've taken or their GPA or whatever, who most excel at honors research. It's the students who come in with something they're really interested in exploring and they are given the, the opportunity, the flexibility and the support to do it. And they're the ones who blossom the most. They're the ones who kind of come in with the most creative, amazing projects at the end of the day. Um, and so I think that that just shows you that there's a there is something for each student like to find about herself and for herself. And that's something that I really love about the school. Thank you. Anybody have one more story before we turn it over? Go for it, Ms. Lena. I think just, you know, I think we do, we, we find so many of those stories in the performing arts, you know, because we, we take students as they are um, in their basic intrinsic selves. And as you push them forward and push them forward and just seeing that blossoming um, over the years, and I'm generalizing because we see it so often, you know, and sometimes the students themselves don't even, don't even realize, and, you know, 10 years later, you get a, a card or a letter or an email, and they, they suddenly realize how much they've grown, um, but it's taking the student where they are, knowing already where they can go, and just gently leading them, leading them there to their own amazement at times, and it's really, really wonderful to see. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for sharing so generously of your time and your stories and your talents. It's just a great pleasure and honor to, to work with all of you. And I welcome uh, Christine back to conclude our evening. What a great way to end the evening. Um, I just wanna thank Laura and all the faculty members who joined us this evening. Our hope is that this gave you a glimpse into the relationship between our students and our incredible teachers. Um, as a reminder, we had so many questions submitted prior to tonight that we were not able to answer questions in real time. So if there's anything that we did not cover, please email us at admissions at marlboro.org and we will get back to you. And I just want to mention that our deadline is January 6th, uh, but we have started to meet with students and encourage you to submit an application if you plan to pursue Marlboro. So going to end this evening. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful, wonderful night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.